and then I'll start with an opening prayer. So uh, please let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you once again this day to worship you and to praise you and to glorify you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for uh, blessing us to be here tonight at this conference and also blessing us with the message from Pastor Wenstrom. We know that your Spirit has been working within him to prepare this, and we have now readied our souls so that the Spirit can teach us these things so that we can apply it as we go forward in our daily walk. And so, Father, we thank you for our fellowship that we have uh, together with each other and also with you. And Father, we can't thank you enough for all the blessings that you have given to us and provided for us. And we ask that you allow this time to be meaningful and real as we glorify you and worship you and praise you in all that we do. So, Father, we thank you for this time together in Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, before I have uh, Pastor Bill uh, uh, come up, I just want to uh, also uh, share with you, and I I forgot to mention this last night, but in front of you in your tables, you all have a little packet that you're supposed to take, okay? I know you see something, oh, I shouldn't take this, I don't know. But uh, you all have a little packet that you, uh, you know, please take this home with you, because this is really for you. And what we have in here is a couple of things, and uh, first and foremost, we have uh, the business card for our church, and uh, there's, I think, at least one, uh, we have a lot more business cards Uh, But we also have four other cards that are kind of evangelistic tracks, as we call them, uh, that are for you to hand out to people as you might meet them on the street, on your job, in your neighborhood, wherever you might be. This is a little track that you can pass out and continue to tell them about the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, please take these. You can read each one of these. Uh, There are four different types. If you like, uh, we have a lot more of these uh, that we want to give to you and want to hand them out to you. But if there's, as you go through them, if there's one or two that you like more than the others, let us know. And those ones we'll give to you and make sure that you have enough of those. And again, you can just hand these out to people so that they, again, understand the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then also the business card, too. As I said, we've got a lot more of those. And you can hand those out as well so that when you hand the track out, you can say, and if you want to know more information, you can follow up at this address or at this website or wherever the case. So uh, that's available for you, and uh, please take these and uh, hopefully use them wisely. Get them into the hands of the people that need them and, uh, so that uh, many people in your life can come to uh, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so uh, without further ado. All right, we're going to have, uh, with a drum roll, please, okay? We're going to have Pastor Bill Wenstrom is uh, going to come up, and uh, I gushed on him last night. I, I don't think I'll uh, gush on him uh, too much tonight. Uh, you can get the tape from last night if you want to hear the gushing, uh, but in any case, uh, but just say a few things, but uh, as you know, he's a, a dear friend of mine. We were ordained together back in 97 from Pastor Bob McLaughlin down here in Somerset, Massachusetts. Uh, we came up through the ranks together, as we would say, and he's been a blessing in my life. Life, and I can't thank him enough for all his friendship and all that he has done for me, his wisdom, his counsel, and just being there to, you know, uh, to be a sounding board uh, when we're going through doctrines and going through the different aspects of ministry and whatnot. So uh, he's been a fantastic friend, and I love him to death, and uh, he's a very talented pastor teacher. You're all going to see that this evening. He knows his stuff uh, better than most, and uh, he's also a talented musician, which we may get some out of that, not tonight, but maybe another night, but uh, maybe get some songs out of him as well too but uh, just a fantastic all-around guy he lets me beat him in golf all the time so I love him even more for that and uh, so you know you gotta have friends that let you win all the time right now <laughs> just kidding just kidding <laughs> but uh, it's always fun to, to get out and play whenever he's out here but in any case uh, was there something else Beth oh yeah 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 sorry I forgot about the music okay so let's, uh, before Bill comes up, we are going to have a song, and uh, uh, John and uh, Cheryl are going to come up. Is Emily singing tonight? Or Okay. John, Cheryl, and Emily, if you could come forward, and uh, they're going to sing a song for us that uh, gets us going. <clears throat> going to really motivate us, aren't you? <laughs>
will stay I'm not leaving you I know there's friction here The struggle makes us new Wish you never thought you had to go Wish you never thought you had to leave Together we can lift each other up We can build a shelter for the weak No man is an island we can be found No man is an island let your guard down Please don't try to fight me, I am for you We're not meant to live this life alone Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I see fear in your eyes. There's no safety here. Oh, my friend, let me in. I will share your tears. Wish you never thought you had to go Wish you never thought you had to leave We can always lift each other up We can build a shelter for the weak Come on No man is an island We can be found No man is an island Let your guard down Please don't try to fight me I am for you We're not meant to live this life alone Oh, 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 oh. Through trouble, rain or fire Let's reach out to something higher In no life outside each other We are not alone Through trouble, rain or fire Let's reach out to something higher Eyes open to one another We are not alone No man is an island We can be found no man is an island, let your guard down. Please don't try to fight me, I am for you. We're not meant to live this life alone. Oh, 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 oh. oh. to do it alone. Thank you very much. Another great song. Thank you. Just get this up. All right. And now, without further ado, we'll have Pastor Bill Wenstrom come forward and, uh, and uh, now lead us through your message. Thank you very much. How's my uh, mic there? Can you hear me? Karen? Good? Okay, good. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you turn your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 33? And before, we, uh, before I get underway with the message for this evening, I'd like to, if I could, if you bear with me, I'd like to acknowledge a few people in the audience here tonight and uh, who are very dear to me. And... Um, quite a special evening, one, being Jim's church here, uh, but also there's some people in this audience that are very close, to, I'm close to and have done a lot for me over the years and demonstrating the love of God toward me 
and my our needs. And uh, so we'll be talking about the love of God tonight, and these people are, have demonstrated it in their lives toward me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge, if I may, Pastor Jim Ricard, who gushed upon me last evening shamelessly. <laughs> that $20 went a long way. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> always helps. But uh, Jim is uh, obviously, and, and his, his fabulous wife, Beth, and uh, I always ask her if she has a sister available, but she never does. So, But Beth and, J and Jim have been such dear friends to me, and like Jim said, we're sounding boards for each other. And uh, I was so thankful that we got ordained together because there's not many pastors I'm really close to that I know. And plus, out in Iowa, I'm not really, uh, it's kind of like an obscure you know, out-of-the-way place. So Jim has been a, a godsend, and uh, he's a great teacher. I think he's a very underrated teacher. I also think what makes him even greater teacher is that his conduct. And we'll be talking about conduct in relation to our witnessing for Christ to the non-Christian. Jim's a great uh, man of God. He is, his conduct, he practices what he teaches. And uh, so I'm very, I respect him very much for that, and he's, he's a great uh, example for the body of Christ to follow, and his church should be very, very, uh, very, very thankful that they have a man of his caliber uh, behind this pulpit. And uh, I just think the world of him and his wife, Beth, who is a lot of pastors' wives, a lot of people don't realize the pastors' wives get hit with stuff a lot harder many times than the man behind the pulpit. So you're also very blessed to have uh, Beth as... Jim's wife, so, yes. I would also like to acknowledge uh, here in the audience um, uh, Titus and Jody Thompson we talked about last evening, and where are they? Titus and Jody, they're probably hiding. Where are you? Right in front. <laughs> and uh, Titus and Jody, what can I say? When I went through our church split in 2010, they, were, they, they and a couple of other families were the came along with me to start a new church in Marion. And then we were in the middle of Romans, and I was like, i got to finish Romans. And Jody and Titus go, you got to stay in Iowa. you got to finish Romans. So we started it in their house, and we can continue forward. And uh, they were, when everybody else was going against me and abandoning me, they stuck up for me. It was great. And it was, again, another couple that demonstrated the love of God toward me. And Titus and I have grown to be great friends. Um, we always say, if, if it wasn't for the Lord, we probably wouldn't be really good friends because, you know, I don't know, we're just from different walks. And it's kind of funny how God brought us together because we're so different. He's smart, much smart, smarter and intelligent than I am. So that's why God brought him into my life to help me out because I need all the help I can get. So he's, a, he's great. And Jody is always thinking about other people. And again, demonstrating the love of God, she's always about other people. So I'm pointing these people out, not just to talk about them, but just to show you that the love of God is working in the lives of these people. So Titus and Jody are here. I'm very thankful for that. I'm also thankful for John and Alex Woodford are here this evening, and uh, they've been great friends to me too. John has gone back a long way with me, and I married these two like Titus and Jody, and, uh, and uh, it, John and Alex have just been uh, great friends to me over the year as well. I can't even begin to tell you all the things that uh, as, uh, as friends that they've done for me and they've continued to do for me. And I'm thankful I have them and Jim and Beth and John and Titus and Jody in my life. So thank you for being here, guys. And, uh, and I won't tell you the story about I should be married to Alex. Don't, don't tell, go ask John the story later. He's with her now, but it was, it, he, 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 he did something behind my bed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, he, he, she made the right choice, trust me. So uh, also there's another gentleman here who's going to be speaking tomorrow evening. And who came out of the blue in my life, his name is Dr. Von Mancha, and uh, he'll be speaking tomorrow about, with regards to science and the Bible, and I would highly recommend it to, uh, to be here tomorrow evening, uh, because he does a fantastic job. He's a chancellor for Rastio Christi. Uh, Christi. He speaks in different uh, you know, groups uh, in, in, in Alabama area and around the country, and he talks about uh, Christianity and the Bible, uh, science and the Bible, and how they, they're, they're not at odds. And, and he does a real good at talking about, to people about uh, how Christians uh, can believe in science, you know, can talk about science and have a scientific mind and still believe in the Bible. So he, he, there's a lot more to, that we'll, uh, you'll see tomorrow with Vaughn. So Vaughn and his wife, Debbie, have, came out of, out of the blue in my life when the church split happened. I didn't even know they were following my teaching. And they just were there for me. And I remember the... 
It was probably several months after the church split in 2010. And he said, oh, why don't you come down and use our condo in Pensacola? I was like, sure, why not? <laughs> Great. I didn't even know them. They, here they are inviting me down there. So they, they've, ever since then, they've been a great supporters of our ministry. And uh, he's been a great friend of mine. And I'm very uh, honored to have him in my life and Debbie as well. So thank you, all of you, all, all of the couples I've mentioned. And then there's another couple in the audience. And uh, uh, they are the... Uh, you know, uh, and what, what can I say? They're my parents, Bill and Ellie Wenstrom, they're right over here. And um, the, my mother, the most beautiful woman in the world, the redhead over here, and the handsomest guy I know, Bill Wenstrom Sr. So, uh, so, <laughs> so they, my parents, they were right. Uh, you always remember you talk about you can never appreciate your parents till you're older. Well, they were right about a lot of things, and thank you for telling me the right things to do. And even though I might have rebelled, at you, rebelled against you, many times I did. And uh, to my own, uh, it hurt me to, by doing so. But thank you for being great parents and uh, always being there for me. And my dad and my mo mother, my, now my great friends of mine, I consider them both not just my parents, but great friends and great people. And they gave me a great uh, upbringing, great work ethic. So I'm, it's a very special evening for me because of these special people in my life. So thank you to all of you and also to uh, everyone, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Grace Fellowship Church, uh, all of you guys, uh, um, you know, Dave and, and Andy Ricard. And I mean, they came to Iowa with me when I, there's just so many people I can name, but thank you very much for all of you for being here this evening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. So, so thank you for having me, but now let's, uh, the person we're here to worship is uh, Jesus Christ, and that's why uh, I do what I do. I believe in what I, I believe in what the Bible says. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, as you, all of you do, and there are certain things that Jesus Christ and the Father and the Spirit want us to do, and we're going to talk about that this evening, what they want us to do in relation to the person who's n not a believer, not a Christian. When I say not a Christian or not a believer. What I mean is, for instance, if the definition for a Christian for me is someone who's trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm not talking about your denomination, whether you're Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, uh, Baptist, whatever you are. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, you're a part of the body of Christ. You're a part of the family of God. You're a part of the body of Christ. Christ is the head. And now we're an extension. Because we're believers in Jesus Christ, we're now an extension of Jesus Christ. The head and the body metaphor that is used many times in, in Scripture, in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 1, it's there for a reason. It, one is to give us encouragement that we're intimately connected to Jesus Christ, that we have eternal security. And also that he's trying to use us and to reach out to a lost and dying world. You and I live in a culture in America called the postmodern world where it's antagonistic and uh, against the Bible and against Jesus Christ and against Christianity and Judeo-Christian Judeo ethic. It's a world that is tr becoming increasing, increasingly, increasingly, increasingly uh, having animosity towards the Christian church and the Bible and Bible teaching and, and pastors and evangelists that proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you live in a, in a culture now that doesn't have a, the background that the culture America had 100 or 50 years ago where people had a, a, an understanding of the Bible in general terms. In our culture today, people don't know anything about the Bible. They're totally ignorant of the Bible, most, most Americans today in Western civilization. So we're up against it. So Jim talked, Pastor Jim talked about our words and proclaiming the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ to the non-Christian is that you're a sinner. You need a savior. God is holy and you're not. You're not perfect. None of us are. So they're all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. The good news, which the word gospel means, is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, became a human being and died on the cross for you, rose from the dead on the third day, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. The Father did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So the Father wants to, all men to come to a saving knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ. But not all human beings will, because God has given us volition. We're not robots, and it's, up, it's between us and God. What will we do about Jesus Christ? What do you think of Christ, what Jesus said to Peter? What do you think of Jesus Christ? Who do you think he is? And that's the issue. And listen to me. 
you hear about miracles and people make a big thing about miracles and God parting the Red Sea and the creating the time, matter, space continuum with just the word. That was only God's sovereign will involved. But when we get, when a human being, a sinner like you and I have become Christians and have, have been regenerated and saved, we call it, delivered. Saved means we're delivered from eternal condemnation, sin, Satan, and his cosmic system. We're delivered from spiritual and physical death through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what salvation means. So when we do that, when we trust in Jesus Christ, we're bending our will to the, the sovereign God. And that's a miracle, a greater miracle than God parting the Red Sea or, or speaking the time, matter, space continuum into existence with just the word. Because there's two volitions involved with our salvation. God's volition, his sovereign will, and our human volition. That's the greatest miracle. So every single one of you who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior are a miracle. It's a supernatural thing. The Holy Spirit comes in when the gospel is being proclaimed to us and makes it understandable to us. He convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment. He convicts us that Jesus is the Savior. Every human being has this happen to him. And you now have to make a choice whether to trust in Jesus or not. It's between you and God. And so we could never get saved without God. His sovereign will for decreeing that we would get saved, he had to first elect us and predestinate us. Then the, Jesus Christ had to go to the cross, then rise from the dead to make salvation possible for us. And then the Holy Spirit had to convict us of the gospel and then regenerate us and place us in union with Christ when we trusted in Jesus as Savior. It's a supernatural event that took place, our salvation. Now, what do we do after we're in God's family? Well, God's trying to get more people into his family. That's his desire. He desires all men to be saved. It says in 1 Timothy 2.4. It says in 2 Peter 3.9. And many other passages. Christ died for everyone. Past, present, and future. Male, female. Slave and free man. Jew and Gentile. Everyone. He desires all to be saved. So how is he going to do that? Through us. Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. He sent his spirit to indwell us so that we could be an extension of him and reach out to the non-Christian. To the Muslim, to the, to, the, the, to the agnostic, the atheist. He loves all of them. We used to be a part of that crowd. So how does he do this? One, as Pastor Jim pointed out, our words. Communicating the gospel accurately. You, have to be, you don't have to be, if you're intellectual, that's great. If you're not, just be yourself and talk to people about, like Jim mentioned so eloquently, Talk to people, have a conversation with them, have a cup of coffee with them at Starbucks and just talk to them about Jesus. In a, not in a, a ostentatious or, you know, a, a, a contrived way, but in a relaxed manner, like you're talking to somebody about the football game or something. Talk to him. Talk to them about Jesus in a conversational manner. There's also something very much, so much, so important that actually uh, serves as a foundation for our words, and that's our behavior our conduct, how we operate, how we act with each other. I'm not even talking right now about, we'll talk about that a little bit later, about how we relate to the non-Christian, how we deal with them. They are watching us, the non-Christian community. They watch when we come in through these doors. They watch the way we treat each other. The way we treat each other, if it's through the love of God, will draw them. It's an attraction. We live in a world where people are... There's, uh, there's all kinds of problems with drug abuse. There's problems with alcoholism in this world. People have been abused by their parents. People have been abandoned by their parents. There have been women, and me uh, women who have been beat up and uh, abused by their husbands. There have been men who are in bondage to pornography and all types of uh, vices out there, gambling and everything. And they're enslaved and they're, and they're miserable and they need, they, they're looking for happiness. And, they're look and we're the ones, are the lights of the world, that are holding up this happiness to them. They can have it. Everybody's looking to be loved. When we operate in God's love toward each other, that's attracting. That's attracting, that's attracting to them. Remember, Jesus said, if I go to the cross and I'm lifted up, I draw all men to him myself. Now, what was he doing? He's demonstrating the love of God on the cross for all men. Now, if we demonstrate that very same love in our lives, why, the way we deal with each other, that's going to draw 
men to the Savior. It actually convicts them. The Spirit uses when we were when we're operating in the love of God to each other, the Spirit is using us in convicting the Christian, the non-Christian, the non-believer, that Jesus is the truth, that the Christian way of life is the truth, the way and the life. There's, there's no other way to the Father except through Jesus. Our conduct is convicting them of that. We need to understand that. So the way we function as a church is critical. So I have you at John's Gospel, chapter 13. And look at John chapter 13, verse 33. Now the Lord Jesus Christ taught in John 13, verses 34 and 35, that if we love each other as Christians, as he loved us, all people will know that we're his disciples. It is important, people, that all people, or we could say the non-Christian community, the unbelievers, know that we're disciples of Jesus Christ. And why? Because God wants them to be saved. In other words, he wants to deliver them from sin and Satan. He wants them to deliver them from these things and bring them into his family. And he wants to use us. Christ is the head, we're the body. We're the arms and the legs of Christ. That metaphor is trying to tell us he's trying to use us. We're an extension of him. And that's why he's given us his spirit. That's why he indwells us. And that's why the Father indwells us. Because they're, try we're, they're trying through us to reach the non-Christian community. So, in John chapter 13, verse 33, it says, Little children, Jesus says, this is the night he was betrayed. And this is the night before the cross. Judas had left the room. And he's speaking to the, the, his disciples. He says, little children, I'm with you a little while longer. And you will seek me. As I said to the Jews, but and now I say also to you, where I'm going, he says, to where I'm going, you cannot come. Then he says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now look what he says, by this, by what? Loving one another, as I have loved you, by this all men, all people, the non-Christian, all people will know that you are my disciples. If, here's the condition, if you have love for one another. So, we see here in John 13, 34, the Lord Jesus Christ took the command of Leviticus 19, 18, which, quote, which is quoted in Matthew 22, verse 39, and Mark 12, 31, and he elevated it, if you notice. He gave it a new meaning. Remember, in the Old Testament, they were taught to love your neighbor as yourself. So, Jesus comes along and says, love one another as I loved you. Not looking at your neighbor as yourself. Because he's the perfect embodiment of loving your neighbor as yourself, Jesus was. So what we see here is he gave it a new meaning. And he, he gave it a new meaning in the sense that he commanded his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. And since he fulfilled the uh, command perfectly during his first advent as the lamb without spot or blemish. So when our Lord uh, says that I give you a new commandment, he does not mean new in time. Because this command to love one another was found in the Old Testament, as I said before. So what he's saying here, Jesus is saying, when he says new, he's not saying new in time. He's saying new in quality and character, is what he's saying. In the sense that I have perfectly fulfilled that command to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I am the example to follow. I've given you a visible example to follow. So he is saying that the commandment is new in quality and character and example. Because love would take on a new meaning and he would, when he would self-sacrificially self offer himself up at the cross of Calvary. Now, under the old commandment in Leviticus 19, 18, which is quoted in Mark 12 and also Matthew 22, the test of, of one's love for one's neighbor was love for oneself, if you notice. But now, the test is for this commandment that Jesus is giving is Christ's love for them. Do you realize that the Spirit was given to you and I, and God's Word was given to you and I, so that you could love like Jesus. It is possible, people. I wonder if some of you know that. Maybe, I know some of you do, because of the way you demonstrate it. But He wants, He can work through you. You can love like Jesus loved. But if you don't know His Word, then it ain't going to happen. It, you have to put the hard work in, which many of you do, learning God's Word. And let me, let me tell you something. You're never too old to start. Better to start late than not start at all. It's not how you begin. It's how you finish. So we're to love one another 
and God's given us his spirit and his word so that that can be accomplished. So it is impossible for the believer to fulfill the mandate to love one another as Christ loved him until he first accepts by faith that he is the object of Christ's love. Did you hear what I said? You and I have to accept by faith that Jesus and the Father and the Spirit love you. Do you know that? If you don't think that, I can always tell when somebody in the Christian community doesn't believe that God loves them by the way they treat their fellow Christian. They don't treat them in love. If you, tr if you believe that the love that God has, had for has for you, you would turn around and exemplify that love and practice that love to your fellow Christian. And we're going to talk about a little bit what that looks like, what God's love looks like in our lives. So I want to show you a passage. Uh, go to uh, 1 John now. Go to 1 John. When John wrote J the Gospel of John in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he wrote it as an old man. He wrote it in his 90s at the end of the 1st century. Look at 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and look at verse 7. First John chapter 4, verse 7. And First John is toward the end of the Bible. Revelation is the last book in the New Testament. And before that, you'll have Jude, and then you'll, have, you'll see 1st, uh, 2nd, and 3rd John. So First John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, that means you're the object, object of God's love. You're the beneficiary of God's love. You're all beloved. He, all of those who trust in Jesus as Savior, he are beloved. God considers you beloved. You're his children. So beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. And when he says that, he means you're not experiencing, you don't have an experiential knowledge of God. You might know him theoretically, and you are saved. He's not denying that. He said, but you're not living your life in an experiential sense in fellowship with God. So he says, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son, meaning his one and only son, into the world so that we might live through him, his son. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He initiated the relationship with us. So it says, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's not a choice. It's obligation. You don't have any choice in the matter. You better do it. In other words, you ought to do it means you're obligated. So I remember one time uh, somebody, uh, I remember Titus was talking to somebody and with regards to the church split, and uh, there was something of a forgiveness issue and, and, and thing, and the, Titus said, hey, what about forgiveness? What about forgiving? And the person didn't say anything. They wouldn't forgive. They were implacable. They're not loving God. They think, they think, they, they, they think that they don't, they're not obligated to love or forgive another Christian. They're wrong. They are obligated. You're obligated to love each other. If God has loved you and me, we're obligated to love each other. And we'll talk about that. That love is not a human love. It's a, it's a love that's supernatural produced in us by the Holy Spirit when we obey what he says in the word of God. So then he goes on to say, verse 12, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, meaning have fellowship with him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed. Listen to what he says. That's faith. We have come to know and we have believed, it says, the love which God has for us, which backs up my point that it's impossible for the Christian to fulfill the mandate to love one another as Christ has loved you and I until they fir we first accept by faith God's love for us, or that we're the object of Christ's love. You're loved. That's the only, until you accept that by faith, you're never going to exemplify that love to other Christians and the other the non-Christian. So he says, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God 
abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love, mature love, casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We loved because he first loved us. Our love, the love of God, is to be reproduced in us by the Holy Spirit when we obey what he says in the word of God. The Spirit will reproduce this love in our lives. So it's a love that is based upon His love. It's His love that we're using with each other. That's what we need to be aware of. And we have to first accept by faith Christ's love for us. So the fact that the believer is the object of God's love provides them with a capacity to love others and to execute the command to love his fellow believer as Christ loved. Now God's love for the believer serves as the power people and the motivation to obey the command to love one another as Christ loved them. So the Christian must experience God's love first before they can obey the command to love one another as Christ loved. Now, let's talk about this love. It's produced by the Holy Spirit in the Christian when the Christian obeys what the Spirit is saying to us in the Word of God. You've heard me say it, for those who are in my congregation know this, and Jim teaches this. The, the Word of God, the Old and New Testament, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 teaches that, among other passages. The Spirit has inspired the Scriptures through the human authors of Scripture. God so supernaturally moved and directed the human authors of Scripture that without coercing their volition, their likes or their dislikes, their intellect, anything like that, God's complete and connected thought to mankind was com communicated in perfect accuracy in the original languages of Scripture. So the Spirit, will re when we obey what He's saying in the Word of God, He's going to reproduce this love, this God's love in our lives. Let me show you this. Go, go, go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. You got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts. You got Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Keep going, then you run into Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. So that means he's talking to Christians. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, your sin nature, which we all have. But through love, serve one another. If you love one another, as Christians, you're going to serve each other. The people who are serving the body of Christ are the ones who are loving. So he says, through love, serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh, the actions of the flesh, the sin nature, are evident which are Im immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. These are all manifestations of the fact that we're sinners when we get involved in these things. And things like these of which I forewarn you, and just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit, that which the Spirit produces in us when we obey His voice in the Word of God is love, is joy, is peace, is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. The production of the Spirit is love. God's trying to reproduce His love in our lives. And that love, we're to exercise toward each other. And when we do that, the non-Christian community takes note of that. There was a great, uh, ch uh, there was a great uh, church uh, father, Tertullian, and he quoted the pagans, the unbelievers, the heathen of the Roman Empire, and they said, boy, how they love one another, speaking of Christians. What was the mark of Christianity? Was how they loved one another. And that should be the mark of our church, 
of our churches. So the Holy Spirit is producing this love. That's why I call it a divine love. Divine love exercised by Christians is distinguished from the exercise of human love in that the former is a response to, to faith, a response of faith to God's love for them. And it's an expression of faith in God's love for them, whereas human love is based upon the attractiveness of the object. So, Christians can love their neighbors, uh, love their enemies. Jesus died on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Christ died for his enemies. People die for their country, their families, they love. People who are attracted to him. A nation of people who are attracted to him. A way of life that they're, that's attracted to him. There's no, there's no, that's a great virtue, but it's not as great as the virtue of Christ dying for his sinners who are his enemies. So we can't love our neighbor, we can't love the, with this love unless the Holy Spirit's reproducing it in our lives. And we ha it's, a, it's reproduced in our lives when we have faith in God's word and what he says about us. So divine love, divine love doesn't need an attractive object. God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son. Well, the world was appalling to him. God's holy. We're disgusting to God. It's, it's, that's what the Bible says. There's none righteous, no, not one. Stop comparing yourself to Hitler. Yeah, I'm better than Hitler. We're all better than Hitler. But we're not comparing human beings to human beings. You might be better than some Osama bin Laden. And you say, well, I'm better than the, the prostitute. I'm, I'm better than the pornographer. Or the child molester, but God looks at us in one big group as terrible sinners. Why do you think Christ had to come to the cross? Why do you think God had become a man? Perfection, God required, so he sent his son. He did what we couldn't do, provide a perfect sacrifice. So that's how much, and he did it out of love. So Christ, God's love, doesn't need an attractive object. This is the love that should be in Christian marriages. So when the husband is obnoxious and he's got this big bear belly and he's sitting on the couch and he's not doing what you, wa what you want him to do, honey, I need the, the house picked up, the house is falling down, or he's doing something that's uh, driving you crazy or obnoxious or he's picking his nose or I don't know what he's doing, and passing gas, and you're, you're going to sit there and you're going to go, yeah, you're probably going, oh, amen to that, right? My husband does that. And you're going to say, how can I love this guy? I want to divorce this guy. I want Brad Pitt or the, or the wife. You know, you're starting to get upset with a wife. You know, she doesn't know how to cook. She doesn't uh, give me the attention I want. She's, you know, you name it. The guys will complain about anything, right? So I'm not trying to blow smoke at the ladies. But what are you going to do when the husband is obnoxious to you? You're going to ditch him? Most people do that. Even in Christianity, the divorce rate is sky high. You need to operate in God's love. So next time the wife or the husband is obnoxious to you, you have to go, well, I'm going to love my husband and my wife because Christ puts up me with me and I'm obnoxious and has forgiven me of all my sins, I think I can put up with my wife and my husband. See, you've got to look back at the cross. The cross, how did God treat you? And then you could start saying, okay, my wife and my husband is not so bad after all. Because I was a lot worse to God than my wife or my husband has ever been to me. That's what we need in Christian marriages. And let me tell you something, Christian marriages... If, the, if we do, as, if, Christian, if the partners in Christian marriage do what they're supposed to do, it's a tremendous witness. If they see the love of God in your marriage, you don't think that doesn't make an impact on them? Because everybody's miserable. Everybody's looking for love in all the wrong places, right? The song says they can look to you and they can say, oh, that's what it's supposed to be about. How, he, the, how the husband is self-sacrificial toward his wife and cherishes her and, and treats her with compassion and is con kind and considerate and the wife is, 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 is looking out for her husband and is obedient to her husband in all things as under the Lord, as under the Lord. And the, and the husband is loving his wife like Christ loved the church. That's a witness to the non-Christian community. Don't underestimate it, people. Don't underestimate the impact your marriages can have toward the, the, the non-Christian community. So God's love is superior. And it's supernatural. When someone is obnoxious to you and you're driving you crazy and you find yourself retaliating against them or re reacting toward them in a negative way or getting back at them, you're not operating in God's love. And you say, how can I do it? You can't do it on your own. You've got to look back what the Word of God says. God, 
sent his son for me and I'm a wicked sinner. Look at how he's treated you and then you put things in perspective. You've now got the power to go and use that love and forgive and be tolerant and patient with the obnoxious person in your life. But you've got to always look back at the cross. How did God treat you and I? That gives you the motivation and the foundation for your treatment of your fellow Christian and all, and all people. So God's love in our lives is motivated by our love for the Lord. And our love for the Lord is demonstrated by our obedience to his command to love one another. And our obedience to his commands is the result of our faith in his love for us. This is why Paul taught that Christians are to love and forgive each other as God through Christ loved and forgave all of us. So look at Ephesians chapter 4. You're in Galatians. Go forward another book and you'll have Ephesians. Right after Galatians. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Then no chapter break in the original. Therefore be imitators. Ephesians 5.1 Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love. Meaning your lifestyle. Live by means of God's love. Just as Christ also loved and gave himself up for us. And offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now why do I need to go to these passages? Because we're talking about Jesus said. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, loving one another as I have loved you, all men will know you, my disciples. And why did God want everybody to know we're Christ's disciples? So he could draw people into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ, using us to do it. So that's what, it's, that's what we have here. Loving one another, forgiving one another, as God as Christ has forgiven and loved us. So, the Holy Spirit, as we saw in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the Holy Spirit enables the believer to experience the love of God in his own life, and the Spirit accomplishes this through faith in the Word of God. Now, through the teaching of the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit enlightens the believer as to the love that God the Father has exercised toward them as manifested through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is so instrumental in our lives. He is, we're totally dependent upon Him. We cannot live the... The Christian way of life is a supernatural way of life that demands a supernatural means of execution. And that's why you were given the Spirit and the Scriptures. You've got the power. You've got the power. It's a question of do you have faith in God's Word? Because He wants to work through you and me. And He wants to reach those people out there. He wants to reach the, he wants to reach the, the Muslim. He wants to reach the atheist. He loves them all. He wants to reach the Buddhist. He wants to reach the homosexual, the lesbian. He wants to reach the child molester, the pornographer. But it can't happen if we're not going to do anything about it and, and neglect our relationship with God and not love each other as Christ has loved us. So obedience to the command to love one another as Jesus Christ loved all of us is the result of the Christian exercising faith in the Spirit's revelation in the Word of God concerning the Father and the Son's love for them which has been exercised towards them through the death of Jesus Christ. Remember Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up to me. That should be our motto as well, like Paul's. Follow his example. So God's love is produced by the Holy Spirit through the Christian. And the Christian is obedient to the Spirit the Spirit-inspired command to love one another as Christ has loved all of us. So when we obey the command to love one another as Christ loved, we reflect. We reflect God's love. We reflect, we reflect God's love, but in order to obey this command, we must prayerfully meditate upon the Spirit's revelation in the Word of God of the Lord Jesus Christ's self-sacrificial love for us. You hear what I said? Prayerfully meditate. Once the last time, you sat down with your Bible and looked at a passage like, John 3, 16 through 18, or Romans 5, 6 through 8, and thought about, man, he loves me. Look at, think about how wicked, and, how wicked and terrible you are. I think about the things that I used to say and do to my mother and father. 
say that they dishonored them as a teenager and as a young kid, how rebellious I was. It's embarrassing to think about. But you know what? Christ still went to the cross for me. He still loved me. He, saw, he, he, saw, he, he had a plan for me. And that, that plan was something that could be accomplished in my life if I just had faith. And I had faith in him. And he's still working on me. To, and like all of you, we're a work in progress, shaping and molding his son in our lives. So we have, to, we have to exercise faith in God's love for us. We must accept by faith the Spirit's revelation of the Lord's self-sacrificial love and service for us and which faith expresses itself in obedience to the Lord's command to love one another as he has loved us. So when we obey the command to love one another as Christ loved, we're in effect responding to God's love for us, which he demonstrated at the cross 2,000 years ago. God wants to reflect his love through us. Faith in God's word. We know we're having faith in God's word when we obey God's word. Now, what is, now we're talking about this love. I want to show you briefly what, what does this love look like? Well, if you ever see the one another commands in the New Testament, for those of you who've been Christians for a number of years reading the Bible, you just notice these one another commands. Well, there, if we do those one another commands, that's the manifest, we're going to manifest God's love. We're going to reflect God's love. And that's going to be taken note of by the non-Christian community when we reflect that love toward each other. So what is this love? Well, if we love one another, we won't bite and devour one another, as we just read in Galatians. We won't stab each other in the back. We won't slander each other. We won't, we won't get involved in the sins of the tongue. We, if we love one another, we won't bite and devour one another. We will not challenge or envy one another. More relationships have been busted up because of envy and jealousy. Marriages have been busted up because of that. So if we love one another, we won't challenge one another, envy one another. We won't speak evil or complain against one another. We won't be, we'll be devoted to one another, Romans 12, 10. We'll have the same mind toward each other. You know, the great ones in the kingdom of God. You ever read Philippians chapter 2 where Paul says, be humble? How do you be humble? Consider each other as more important than yourself. Didn't Christ do that? He considered others more important than himself. The great people in the kingdom of God are not going to be the great evangelist who led many people to the Savior. Maybe he'll be in the, up in the top echelons of Christ's government, but it'll probably be the, it'll be the people who were humble and manifested that humility and that they always thought about other people. John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Well, we could paraphrase that. So ask not what the church can do for you, but what you can do for the church. And Jesus Christ, what are, you gonna, what, what are you doing about this? Are you serving? Are you giving? Are you taking part in a, 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 a church where there's a pastor and that you're learning and being held accountable? We need this thing. God has set up a church and a pastor so that we could be held accountable, so that we could grow, so we could be trained to go out and evangelize the non-Christian community so that we could serve in the body of Christ. So if we love one another, we'll regard each other as more important than ourselves. The people who are great in the kingdom of God are those who think of others first. Think of others first. It's not about you. Not about me. It's about others. You've got to think about other people. We're a narcissistic society. That's a big word for saying... I'm selfish and self-centered. We all are. We're all sinners by nature and practice. We're all by nature narcissistic. We're all by nature selfish and self-centered. If you don't think that, you got a big problem there. You're the worst person to reach. It's like the husband and the wife and the husband, he's always right about you. The lady will get a great... How many guys do you know that they're the smartest guy in the world. They know everything. Oh, those are the worst people in the world to deal with because they can never t point out to them that they're wrong about anything. I should know. I'm like that by nature, too. If anybody's ever seen my bad side, we're all like that to a certain extent, some more than others. So the people who are great are the, are the people like, you know, the pastor Jim Ricard is always thinking about others or the Beth, Beth Ricard or the, the Jody and the Titus Thompsons. Always thinking about other people you know, what can I do for, the, for my brother and sister in Christ? Those are the great ones, that, like, people like that. You know, the Barnabas, the Apostle Paul, uh, the uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple that's mentioned in the Romans. Married couple, they're always thinking about others. Thought about Paul. Timothy, 
Guys like that. Titus. These are the people. That's what, we, that's what love looks like. They think of, love thinks of others. If we love one another, we'll bear with one another. We'll comfort one another. Uh, we'll hold each other accountable. One of the great things about Pastor Jim Ricard, and pastors need to have this, is we hold each other accountable. If he says, hey, Bill, you're out of line here. Sometimes it's hard to talk to a pastor, a man in power, anybody who's in power, and tell the king, you know, you're wrong. Nathan the prophet had to do that to David. What a brave man he was. He could have, David could have executed it right there. Sometimes it's hard to talk to somebody who's, you know, in authority and say, hey, you know, you're out of line here. Well, Jim holds me accountable. Hey, I've no time. Titus held me accountable. We need that. That's love. Love holds each other accountable. You're wrong in here. Do it in gentleness. You know, you're wrong here. You need, to you need to change this here. So love, manifestation of God's love that we have for, with each other is that we hold each other accountable. That's why it's important to go to belong to a church, to send an authority of a pastor. We have, because you, need, you and I need to be held accountable. If you don't think so, you're going to destroy yourself. I know pastors who will not be held accountable for their behavior and they're drinking themselves and doing drugs and having, being promiscuous in sexual relationships and they're destroying their lives and their marriages and their churches and their families and it breaks my heart. No accountability. If we love one another, we're going to stimulate one another to the performance of good works. We'll pray for one another. Do you pray for your fellow Christian? I pray for, we're supposed to pray for people who don't even know, know personally. We're to pray for each other. We're members of each other. We should care for each other. You know, we're the members of the body of Christ. Do you care about your left leg, your right leg? Do you care about your hand? Yeah. Well, that's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to care for each other. You know, we're going to be in heaven with each other forever. If the rapture happens tonight, the resurrection of the church, it's imminent. It could happen anytime while I'm speaking, and we're all with each other forever. This is the way it's going to be forever, guys. We should care for each other. If that's the case, we need to care for each other. We have to pray for one another. Pray every day for each other. Pray for me. I pray for you all the time. We need it. Do you, you think the world is going to give us any support? you think the world's going to stand by us? You think the devil's going to stand by us and the kingdom of darkness? No, we got to band together. One of the great things about the patriots is they always stick together. There's no backstabbing. They keep, if there's any problems, they keep it in-house and they win consistently because, one, there's respect for authority. The owner, Belichick, if you don't abide by the rules, Brady has to do it just like anybody else. If you don't, you're out the door. You're not following the patriot way. In fact, they go by the motto, team first. Kind of a Christian thought, really. It really is. So, you th so how much more should the body of Christ stick together and pray for each other and pull for each other? We need that. Not just not your own church here. You should, we should be, I should, my, ch my church, I should, we pray for Jim's church and other churches around that we know. We, 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 it's not just concern for your own local assembly you belong to, but other Christian assemblies that you know that are teaching the word of God and are faithful. You need to pray for them too. We're in enemy territory. We need each other's support and prayer. Prayer is how God works too in the world. He works through the prayers of his saints. I didn't come, that didn't originate with me. That originated with somebody. I, don't, I can't remember off the top of my head. Read somewhere. Quoted by somebody. God works through the prayers of his saints. Praying is asking for what God wants, not what we want. And what does God want? It's in his word. He tells you what he wants. Now, if we love one another... We'll be hospitable to one another. Barry and Sue opened up their home to Titus and Jody. Let them into their home. And that's not easy to do, let somebody into your home. I know that because I've had Vaughn and Debbie and, uh, the, and uh, the John, and, John Woodford and, and, and uh, Alexandra open me, uh, Alex open me, uh, let me go into their home. I mean, that can't be easy. I mean, you're letting somebody into your home, into your life, they're hospitable. That's the love of God. Hospi hospitality is something that Christians did in the first century all the time. You know why? Because they were displaced through persecution. They lost their homes. They lost everything. They needed other Christians to open up their homes for them. We need it today, too. If we love one another, 
we'll be humble toward each other. We'll be humble toward each other. Now, I want to wrap up. I want to tie everything together. Because we went back at the beginning to John 13, 33, and 34. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. By this, loving one another as I loved you. All men will know you're my disciples. And why does, God, why does Jesus want that? Because God wants all men, all people, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to be a part of his family. So we've talked about what love looks like and how importance of faith is and that God's trying to reflect his love through us. Now, when the Christian community reflects with each other the Lord's love for them, they manifest the love of God to the non-Christian, which is ultimately designed to attract the non-Christian to Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that. When the Christian community reflects with each other the Lord's love for them, they manifest the love of God to the non-Christian community, which is ultimately designed to attract the non-Christian to Jesus Christ. Didn't Jesus just say, if you, by this loving one another as I loved you, all men will be aware of the fact that you are my disciples. So he's telling us, the unbeliever will see that we have the truth. That we have the truth in Jesus. That we're, by manifesting his love, we're showing that Jesus is the Savior to the non-Christian. So when we reflect with each other the Lord Jesus Christ's love for us, God the Holy Spirit is convicting the non-Christian through the body of his Son, the church. So the church is the, the church that is Jesus the, is the truth and the Savior. So when we reflect with each other the Lord Jesus Christ's love for us, the Holy Spirit is convicting the non-Christian through the body of his Son, the church, that Jesus is the truth and the Savior. He's using us. We're the body. He's the head. You hear him, Jesus say, you're, I'm the vine. You're the branches. I am the chief cornerstone. You're the cor stones of the building. Head, I'm the head. You're the body. Why is he saying all these metaphors? He's trying to tell us how we're an extension of him, how we're intimately connected to him. He is, he is the bridegroom. We're the bride. He's trying to show us how intimately connected we are to him and that he's trying to use us to show God's love to a lost and dying world, and this world needs love. You know, the, world, the song was, when I was growing up, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. But what love are we talking about? The love the, of the Beatles sang about? I mean, there's nothing wrong with the, you know, human love, and the what love between a man and a woman. That's from God. It's a gift from God. But he's talking about a love that's superior. He's talking about the love that we've been talking about tonight, God's love, reproduced in our lives by the Spirit when we have faith in what in God's love for us. So God manifests himself to the non-Christian community, and specifically his love, when the Christian community reflects his love with each other, and through this manifestation of his love, attempts to draw the non-Christian to himself. And as I said earlier, in John 12, 32, Jesus taught that when he is lifted up, meaning the cross, he, he's referring to his crucifixion, and he said that the cross would draw all men to himself. Why would it draw all men to himself? Because that is where God is showing love for his enemies, you and I. And if that love is in our lives, it's going to draw the non-Christian to the Savior. It's going to draw them to faith in Jesus Christ. Your conduct and mine. The way we behave with each other. You've got to stop thinking about individual, individuality. You are individuals. God love, gives us individuality, but he also is given diversity. We're all different, but we're unified. You gotta start thinking of yourselves as a corporate unit, as a team, not independent of each other. You're intimately connected to each other in Christ. You gotta look at each other as a team, as a corporate unit, because if you don't, we're, we're gonna fail and we're not gonna reach our, our, our we're not gonna reach the non-Christian community. Listen, I say this to my congregation all the time, and Titus and Jody will probably probably beat me before I say it. This world, this country, let's just talk about our country. This country doesn't need another political program or another political slogan. It doesn't need another law. It doesn't need, there's no, there's no uh, political candidate that's going to solve our problems in this country. We have social, economic uh, problems. We have political problems. We have drug problems. We have all kinds of problems in our society. And they can only, they're all attributed to one, two things, sin and Satan. That's what the Bible says. Who do you think is going to solve those problems? The next president? Some of you are really don't get it. You put too much stock on human beings. 
I'm not saying you don't, can't vote for the guy. You have this right in this country, but they are not going to solve the problem. You know, when I was growing up, our heroes in Massachusetts, for those who are, you know, Mass you had a picture, and my, my grandmother said, you had a picture of Jesus, and then there was a picture of John F. Kennedy, and there was a picture of Martin Luther King. We were growing up, we thought John, when John F. Kennedy got assassinated, I was too young, but I remember them saying, and Bobby Kennedy was like, people were crushed. They were tr putting their trust in a man. And then when the man was gone, so was the dream. It was all, what happened? It was nothing. It was ashes. We can't put our trust in men. The Bible condemns that. You don't put your trust in princes. You put your trust in the Lord. The Lord controls history. The Lord is the sovereign ruler. He's the one who rules over President Obama. By the way, you're supposed to pray for your president, not speak evil of the rule of your people. Yes, sir. Jesus Christ rules the church. He rules the church. He rules the world, the nations of the earth. He's sovereign, and he will rule on this earth for a thousand years and on into eternity through Jesus Christ, his son. What we need is the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What we need is the gospel, because the gospel gives the good news that solves the problems in our country, which are all attributed to sin and Satan. It's the gospel that's going to change our country. Not another political program, not the Democrats, the Republicans, the Independents, the Libertarians. No, it's the gospel. The same situations that we have in our country today were in the Roman Empire. Same thing. You talk about homosexuality and lesbianism and, you know, working in same-sex marriages and everything. The whole culture is paganized, right? They had that in Paul's day. Jesus lived in a world that was like that. Paul lived in a world like that. Peter, what did they do about it? Did they march around Rome and picket Rome and then, you know, get into political activism? What did they do? They preached the gospel. They lived the gospel. That turned the Roman Empire upside down because within 300 years, Constantine declared that Christianity was now the state religion, which brought about a bunch of problems for that. But Christianity, Christ had conquered the Roman Empire. Do you believe, do you believe the gospel, the power of the gospel? The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Do you believe that? We need to, we need to speak the gospel. We need to live out the gospel. And this will draw the non-Christian community, it will t the non-Christian community will take note of us and will seriously consider, man, I see something in these people and the way they love each other, the way they treat each other, the way they stick together with each other, how they pull for each other and pray for each other. I want that. I want to be a part of that. Everybody's looking to be loved. Why do you think kids in are in gangs today? Because the homes are all busted up. They have no mother and father to give them love, so they go to the gangs. Everybody knows this. It's in, in, it's in prison work and does work with gangs. Well, we can show them as an alternative. God's family right here, you and I, giving them the love and the compassion and the, and, the, and the concern and the love that they need. This is what we're here for, to reveal God's love to a lost and dying world. Can we all bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all your people who are here this evening that are believers in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for each and every one of them who have ventured out here this evening to hear the word of God. We pray the Spirit would touch each heart, that the Spirit would guide them in what, how to apply what they've learned here this evening. We pray that the Spirit would reprove, rebuke, but encourage also and instruct in righteousness so that your people can not only be equipped to serve each other, but also equipped to serve the non-Christian community and to reach out to their family, their friends, their neighbors, and the people in their country and their neighborhoods and show them the love of God and to talk about the love of God, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that this message would empower and motivate your people to good works. And if there's anyone who's listening to my voice, whether in this chapel or through the internet, who is not trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, I'm here to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. For the Father did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You have a volition, or in other words, you have a free will. And you could say to God right now in your own words, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, you have privacy. You can say in your own heart that you're trusting in 
Jesus Christ as your Savior. Not that you acknowledge his existence. Even the demons know that. No, you, you're acknowledging that you're a sinner and Jesus is the Savior and you're putting your faith in him. The Bible says when you do that, you're saved. You have the forgiveness of sins. You're part of his family and nothing can never separate you from the love of God. That's what God wants for you and that's what everyone who's a believer in this room wants for you. But the choice is yours. God didn't make you a robot someone who automatically just does whatever he says. He gave you a free will, and you can make that choice, that decision now, to trust in Jesus Christ the Savior. And let me tell you something. I have to tell you this as well. I have responsibility, and I would, uh, I would be a terrible uh, communicator of God's word if I didn't tell you this. If you don't trust in Jesus, uh, you're in danger of eternal condemnation. God's holy. It's not a popular message. We know that. But God is holy, and, and if you don't want to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior, which doesn't cost you a dime or nickel, nothing. Simple faith. If you don't want to accept him, the only way to heaven, uh, then there's only one place for you, eternal condemnation. And God doesn't want you to go there. That's why he sent his son to the cross. That's why he sent his son into the world to be a human being. For you. For you. So my prayer, the prayer of everyone in this room, is that you would trust in Jesus as Savior. The choice is yours. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Father, we thank you again for everyone here this evening. And we pray uh, that your people would go out and mightily show the love of God toward each other to draw your, the non-Christian to the Savior, your Son. So, Father, we pray for this message in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Again, uh, very motivating and a very powerful message, and uh, thank you very much, Bill, for uh, leading us through that this evening, and uh, fantastic. And uh, again, the love of God is all around us each and every day, and the love of God should be in us each and every day, and as we share that love with one another, again, a world that doesn't love will know that love. So again, thank you for uh, reminding us of that this evening. Appreciate it. Uh, before uh, we do uh, wrap up this evening, uh, when we do finish uh, um, our final uh, Part of this evening, which we're going to do in just a minute. Got one more thing for you that's coming up. But I would like all the able bodied young men to help us. And uh, once we kind of break up a little bit, we want to uh, take down the chairs, or excuse me, the tables, and put them into the uh, office back there. And we're going to set up uh, for tomorrow night because uh, we're going to come back. And uh, tomorrow night was Dr. Vaughn. I guess he just stepped out. Uh, but Dr. Vaughn is going to be uh, speaking with us tomorrow night and uh, really looking forward to that. It's going to be a fantastic message. Uh, Pastor Bill and I will be up here on the stage with him, but he's really going to lead us through a great discussion in regard to science and the Bible and Christianity and faith and all these things coming together. It's going to be a great night. Uh, looking forward to it, so hopefully you can join us uh, for that on uh, Saturday night tomorrow at 7.30. But uh, if all the men could help us break down, we also need to move the, this podium. We're just going to put this over here, and uh, we'll get some chairs up here as well. So we're all set to go for tomorrow night. Also, uh, Tomorrow uh, we do have a, uh, we call it a cookout, but uh, we're not going to have hot dogs and hamburgers. We're going to have chicken parmesan because we're Italian around here. Uh, but ultimately, uh, Steve and Michelle have been working hard with Terry and uh, putting this together for us. And so tomorrow uh, you're all invited to join us at uh, Sue and Barry's house at 110 John Reza Drive here in North Attleboro. And uh, we're going to have a, a nice uh, fellowship and a gathering uh, get-together. We're going to eat about 3, 3.30 uh, so that we can wrap that up and uh, be able to come back for the conference conference tomorrow night, uh, but you can show up there anytime after 1 o'clock, I guess, uh, or uh, closer to dinner time, about 3, 3.30, okay? So you're all invited to that, uh, so uh, please join us for that, and uh, we'll have that great fellowship tomorrow together. All right, uh, let's see. Yeah, and um, so Beth, if you could, oh yeah, okay, yeah. See, it's the worst part of my job. I always forget this, and I, always, I don't like doing it. But in any case, you got to do it, okay? So we're going to take a, a quick little offering.
uh, right now to help us meet the needs and expenses uh, for uh, this conference. And I uh, thank you for your graciousness and uh, for your demonstration of love by giving and your appreciation uh, for what Pastor Bill uh, did for us this evening. And again, uh, let's just offer up uh, a great offering this evening to our Lord so that we can continue to go forward uh, serving him in this local area and getting the word throughout the world. So uh, let's just pray for our offering right now. Father, we just thank you for this time to give to you the first fruits of all that you've given to us. We ask that you take these things that we are offering to you and multiply them so that ultimately you are glorified and your son Jesus Christ is glorified through the gospel and through your word. So, Father, we thank you for this time of offering in Christ's name. Amen.